Ah, childhood. That glorious time when we need someone's permission to do, well, practically everything. And if you were anything like me, you used every trick in the book to convince your parents to let you do things. Like, maybe you asked to borrow the family car every Friday night, but your folks always said no. Ugh, parents. Am I right? So the next time you asked for the car, you said, hey, mom and dad, since you think I'm more mature than I used to be, why not let me borrow the car tonight? I'll be extra careful. And to your shock, your dad agreed. As long as you were home by 11. By using the principles of persuasion, you got your parents to do what you wanted. And they got something out of the deal too. Because while you're hanging out with your friends on a Friday night, they're at home enjoying some peace and quiet. When we use the principles of persuasion in ethical ways by being truthful, authentic, and respectful, we can share our viewpoints with others to build consensus. Like when you're trying to get everyone in agreement about when you can use your family's car. And we can use these principles in many types of communication, like verbal, nonverbal, and organizational communication. I'm Cassandra Ryder, and this is Study Hall Intro to Human Communication. In our last episode, we started digging into one of humanity's communication superpowers, the power of persuasion. Today, we're going to talk about the last three principles of persuasion that Dr. Cialdini wrote about in his groundbreaking 1984 book, Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion. As a quick refresher, liking, which says that we prefer to say yes to people we like. Then there's the principle of authority, the idea that people can be persuaded by someone who has expertise and power, like me, of course. And finally, we learned about social proof, which is when we look at the behavior of others to decide how we should act. These principles deal with our relationships with, and to, other people. These next three principles focus on how we can use social structures to persuade others. And with all six principles in our communication toolbox, we can increase our chances of persuading others. And that's important as we figure out how to become better communicators. Along with just, uh, getting what you want, using persuasion can come with another, less obvious benefit, a chance for relationships to grow. In the case of car ownership, you created an opportunity to prove that you really are responsible, and your parents got the chance to show you that they meant it when they called you mature. So let's complete our picture of persuasion and dive into those final three principles, starting with reciprocity, which is the idea that people feel compelled to pay back debts and return favors. Given what we know about many ancient societies around the world based on things like laws and gift-giving customs, it appears that the principle of reciprocity in human societies is extremely old. Our ancestors apparently realized that sharing goods and services with each other would help them survive and thrive. And because reciprocity has so many benefits, over time, it's become one of the fundamental ways we maintain relationships. That means reciprocity seems to show up in most cultures, according to research published in the Personality and Social Psychology Bulletin in 2020. In other words, reciprocity is a powerful tool for persuading others. For instance, we can use the rule of reciprocity to gain compliance or to get people to say yes when we ask for something. People feel uncomfortable when they're indebted to someone, which means we're more likely to say yes to a request from someone we already owe. So in order to use the principle of reciprocity to get compliance from someone, we have to do something nice for them first. For instance, to get your parents to comply with your request to borrow the car, you could do something thoughtful and car-related for them. This could be something like driving your grandma to her bridge club or picking up your little brother from school. That way, when you ask for the car, your parents remember that they owe you for your daily chauffeur services. Letting you borrow the car is an easy way for them to pay you back for the nice thing you did for them. Another way to use reciprocity to persuade others is through reciprocal concession, which is when we give in to someone else's arguments with the expectation that they will make a concession or give us something in return. There are different types of reciprocal concessions, but one common one is known as the rejection, then retreat. People use rejection, then retreat to get others to agree to a smaller request after making a really big one that the other person will likely say no to. Basically, we use the first bigger request to make our second request seem more reasonable and much easier to say yes to. For instance, when you were trying to get your parents to loan you the car, you could have started with a big request, like asking to borrow the car every Friday night, which you knew they'd reject. So you make a concession or retreat on your original request by saying, that's cool, that's cool, I understand. But since I already have plans this Friday, could I borrow the car just this one time? Because taking the car out once is way more reasonable than letting you use it every Friday, your parents say yes on the spot. 
And you're great with that because borrowing the car once is what you actually wanted out of the negotiation anyway. So you conceded by negotiating down from borrowing the car every Friday and your parents conceded something by loaning you the car to see a movie this weekend. But if there's ever a time when someone is trying to persuade us with the principle of reciprocity and the situation feels off, it's also okay to say no. Now, there are definitely cases when the person you're trying to persuade isn't willing to make concessions. For them, it's always their way or the highway. In this instance, we could try using the principle of consistency instead and draw on the idea that once we make a commitment, we feel pressure to stick to it and be consistent with what we promised. That's because honoring our commitments is a core value in many current societies. For instance, in the United States, people who don't honor their commitments are often labeled as flaky, unreliable, or downright rude. Most of us don't want to be seen that way. So getting people to make commitments is a powerful tool of persuasion because once we're on the hook, we usually find it really difficult to back out of the commitment we made. The key to making consistency work is to get an initial yes from someone by starting with a small, simple request. This is known as the foot in the door technique. For instance, say you're walking through the mall and a kiosk employee asks if you have a quick second to try out their awesome new hair product. And you say yes, because they caught you totally off guard. And since saying yes and then running the other direction is socially awkward, you might feel obligated to stick to your commitment of starting the conversation. And unfortunately, that means listening to the kiosk employee's 15 minute sales pitch. The act of simply getting someone to make a little commitment, like agreeing to a conversation, is pretty persuasive because it gives you the chance to talk them into a bigger commitment down the line. Basically, the little commitment got your foot in the door and now you can walk on in. The consistency principle also explains why we can be convinced to do something someone else wants using lowball tactics. Lowball tactics are when someone offers another person an attractive initial offer, but then downgrades the offer once the other person has accepted. For instance, say you're shopping for a new car because you're tired of asking to borrow your parents. As you're checking out a used car, the salesperson offers you a discount on a new car that would only make it a few thousand dollars more expensive than the model you're currently considering. You were thinking about getting a used model since it's more affordable, but the discount is a great deal. So you say you'll go with the newer model instead. But when the salesperson comes back with documents to sign, he says his manager won't let you have the discount after all. You're now in a tough spot because the main reason you went with the new model was because of the deal. But since you already said yes, you start looking for new reasons to go through with the deal even though you were tricked. Like, the paperwork is right in front of you and the car is pretty cool. Even though backing out now feels really difficult, we should totally be empowered to stick up for what we want and need. It all comes back to consistency. We're compelled to keep our word, even when someone is using lowball tactics to manipulate us into a commitment that isn't worth our time. In a moment like this one, the best way to protect yourself from a bad commitment is to stop, take a breath, and listen to your gut. If your instincts tell you that someone is trying to persuade you to be consistent with a commitment that'll be bad for you in the long run, you don't have to stick to your original yes. So in the case of the pushy salesman, you can avoid their lowball tactics by pushing the car paperwork back across the table and walking away from the deal. And that leads us to the last of Dr. Cialdini's persuasion principles, scarcity. Scarcity makes it seem like opportunities are more valuable because they're limited in some way, which makes us feel like we have to act right this very instant. Now this term doesn't just apply to the field of communication and persuasion. Businesses use the scarcity principle all the time, sometimes out of necessity. But sometimes businesses use the scarcity principle to make us think that things are rare when they actually aren't, like when pumpkin flavored lattes are only available once a year. Of course, we know that coffee shops have the resources to make pumpkin flavored treats any time of year. But the way the opportunity is presented makes us feel like we need to drink all the spicy pumpkin-y drinks before the season ends and they're gone never to return for eight months at least. When businesses use phrases like for a limited time only or only five left in stock, it makes us feel like we'll miss out if we don't make a purchase right that second. But according to psychologists, when we feel like we're missing out on something, our critical thinking skills take a backseat to our desire for instant gratification. And that makes us more prone to make decisions that may not be in our best interest. Like we might buy something that's low quality just because a store offers it at an amazing one-time only discount which makes it seem more valuable to us. For instance, say your phone broke, but you blew your savings on too many pumpkin spice lattes. You decide to shop Black Friday sales to try and get a good deal on a replacement phone. So you make a plan of action. You'll camp out the night before the big sale, be the first in the store, 
and get the best discount before all the phones are gone. And your plan works. You get a new phone at a major discount. But when you get home and look your phone model up online, you realize it has some pretty bad reviews. On top of that, you see that there's another phone that costs a little more than the one you bought, but much better quality. You just didn't do any comparison shopping because you were so focused on making sure you didn't miss the once in a lifetime Black Friday discount. So no matter what we're buying, the scarcity principle is so persuasive because we don't want to miss out on great opportunities. And by making opportunities seem better than they actually are, businesses have a better chance of persuading us to make a decision that benefits them and leaves us holding the bag. Or the phone, in this case. To protect ourselves from getting duped by people using the scarcity principle, we can separate our desire to get something scarce from our desire to actually use it. So when we come across a scarce item and feel like we really want it, it's important to take a second to calm down and reflect. We can ask ourselves, do I really want this item? Or do I just want to get in on this deal? Picturing ourselves actually using the item in the future can help too. If we can imagine ourselves using the item frequently and getting a lot of value out of it, making the purchase is probably worth it. But if we don't, it's probably better to wait until we come across an opportunity that will give us the value we deserve. To recap, over the course of the last two episodes, we've covered the six principles of persuasion, which are authority, liking, social proof, reciprocity, consistency, and scarcity. But no matter which principle we use or encounter, persuasion is a powerful skill. And like any great power, it comes with great responsibility. Because when we're aware of how businesses, advertisers, and other people use persuasion, we can make better decisions for ourselves. And when we use these principles ethically and honestly, we can help others make good decisions too. So whether we're convincing our parents to loan out the car or getting donations for a charity that does all the good, understanding how to use the principles of persuasion sets the stage for positive social interactions throughout our lives. Thanks for watching Study Hall, Intro to Human Communication, which is part of the Study Hall Project, partnership between ASU and Crash Course. If you liked this video and want to keep learning with us, be sure to subscribe. You can learn more about Study Hall and the videos produced by Crash Course and ASU in the links in the description. See you next time.